recent discoveries in modern science have brought the age of materialism to an end. Today, the thorough atheist is hard to find, a rare bird indeed. The enemy of true faith today is not atheism, not total unbelief, but partial belief. For some reason, many people seem to have two kinds of faith. One they reserve for values they consider absolute. Two times two equals four, the law of gravity. And then a so-called religious faith, which is almost a retreat from fact into a realm of fantasy. They seem to have two compartments in their brain. They keep their science on one side, their religion in the other, with a wall between them. They're afraid to remove the wall, fearing that their faith will be swept away by fact and hard reality. To say the least, such a faith lacks honest conviction. Only a faith that is founded on truth can survive and provide the bulwarks so necessary for a nation or an individual. Say, did you ever see a million volts of high-frequency electricity? What has that to do with faith? Nothing, if our faith is just a retreat from fact. But if our faith is founded on fact, then the million volts and everything here in the laboratory has a vital connection. Let me show you what I mean. In the third chapter of John's Gospel, we read about a man named Nicodemus. He came to Jesus one night and said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, to say the least, that's a very startling statement. Does it apply to physical birth? Well, that's what Nicodemus wanted to know. He asked, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, that is truly, truly, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then to further explain his meaning, he said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, nor whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. There are three basic facts in what we have just read. First, there are two worlds or realms, the physical and the spiritual. Second, one of these, the spiritual realm, cannot be seen or known by the physical senses alone. And third, before we can see or enter this spiritual realm, a change must take place in us that is so fundamental and far-reaching that it can best be described as new birth. Do you believe this? A few years ago, it was quite popular to say, I will believe nothing that I cannot see or handle or know with my physical senses. Today, this attitude is considered quite unscientific. Much of modern science deals with very real quantities and qualities that are beyond the range of the physical senses. Do you realize that your most priceless possession is something that you can't see, weigh, or measure? It is possible today to determine the exact chemical composition of a human body. By precise measurements, we can know how much iron, calcium, phosphorus. We can determine exactly how much of each of the elements is present in a body. If we were to make these tests one moment before death, and then again one moment after death, it would be obvious that something was missing but it would be something that you couldn't see, weigh, measure, or put in a test tube. That something is life. This isn't me. This is just the house I live in. Cut off my hand, that isn't me. Cut off my arm, that isn't me. Of course, if you keep on whittling, you'll get me, I'll admit that, but nevertheless, this is just the house I live in. Whatever it is that is really you or me is something that no man has ever seen. Modern chemical science can do some wonderful things. I suppose that today a good chemist in a well-equipped laboratory could make an egg. Chemically speaking, it would be the exact duplicate of a chicken egg. 
It would look like one, leave it around long enough, it would smell like one. But you could put that thing under a hen for all eternity and it wouldn't hatch. You see, science can't put a chicken in the egg. That brings us to the old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Some will say, well, obviously the chicken, or where did the egg come from? Others, the egg, or where did the chicken come from? Push that question as far as you want into the ages past, but you can't possibly escape the ultimate answer that God came first. And immediately, you're in that other realm. One of the most intriguing discoveries in modern science is the fact that there is nothing in this world that even approaches what might be called truly solid. We speak of solids, liquids, and gases. But these terms describe superficial rather than basic properties of matter. All matter, regardless of its state, is composed of invisible particles called atoms, which in turn are composed of other particles. The air we breathe, though invisible to us, is just as real as wood or metal, because it's made of the same fundamental particles. It is the arrangement of these particles and the forces that bind them together that give to a substance its special properties. Air, for example, is composed mainly of oxygen and nitrogen atoms. Now, if we remove the nitrogen atoms and replace them with helium atoms, this new atmosphere will have some of the properties of air, but there will be some obvious differences. For one thing, sound travels faster through a light gas than through a heavy one. And of course, helium is much lighter than nitrogen. I'm going to fill my lungs with this gas now and see if you notice any difference. I am now speaking in just the same tone of voice that I've been using all along. The difference you notice is due to the fact that my lungs are now filled with a helium oxygen mixture, which is lighter than air. And of course, my voice goes up, but now I've got to take a breath. And as I do, my voice goes down one step toward normal. But now, my voice returns to normal. <laughs> Say, if you want to have some fun sometime, get one of your friends who prides himself on being a rugged he-man and fill him up with this stuff and then get him to quote Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> Believe me, the results are amazing. If we bring a piece of steel close to a magnet, we say that the steel becomes magnetized. But what is it that actually happens? If we place the steel inside a coil of wire connected to a high gain amplifier and then bring the magnet close to the bar of steel, we can hear something that suggests movement inside the steel. Listen. think of a piece of steel as being solid. And according to our definition, it is a solid. But the popular concept of what makes a solid is certainly a false one. This piece of steel and any so-called solid substance on this earth is almost entirely empty space. If we could eliminate the empty space in this piece of steel, all that would remain would be a tiny bit of matter so small as to be invisible even with a high power microscope. This concept of almost unlimited empty space within matter is comparatively new, but it is the very cornerstone of our knowledge in this atomic age. Atoms are not solid. Instead, they are tiny solar systems composed of infinitely small particles revolving at tremendous speeds and bound together by enormous forces. And like our solar system, atoms are almost entirely empty space. For the moment, let's forget the forces within the atom. Thinking only of the particles and the empty space around them, science knows no reason why I couldn't take this so-called solid steel bottle and just throw it right on through that wall. Except this, we've tried it and it hasn't worked. If I were to attempt to run through that wall right now, all I'd get for my trouble would be a good-sized lump on the head. But that which would prevent my body passing through the wall would not be a collision of particles, but rather a collision of forces, the same forces that make an atom bomb. And if it were not for these forces, my body could go freely back and forth through that wall just as though it were not there. 
It is within the realm of scientific possibility that there could be two worlds coexistent, occupying the same part of space at the same moment of time, each world just as real as the other, with its mountains, valleys, rivers, trees, and people. And that one world could pass freely through the other world, neither world being conscious of the existence of the other world, if you grant just one thing. Atomic forces within the material substance of these two worlds that are not mutually interactive. What do we mean by this? Let's see. Here are two pieces of steel. Their appearance is quite similar. But a magnet will reveal a basic internal difference between the two pieces. This one, of course, is picked up. But uh, this one is unaffected. This piece of steel is non-magnetic, stainless steel. Of course, we all know that other metals, such as brass or aluminum, are not affected by the magnet. But a ring made of aluminum is something else. It can be suspended in air by the electromagnetic force of what is actually a transformer. The ring being, in effect, a one-turn shorted secondary. A smaller ring will react even more violently. Here is another ring. This one made of a material we say is non-conductive. And it is completely unaffected. Here is another example. Several thousand watts of power were involved in that spark. If we replace the spark gap with a copper coil, the same power now flows through the coil. It's invisible, has no effect on many substances, but it can generate a lot of heat. Wood, paper, things that we think of as being quite inflammable are not affected at all. However, a piece of steel wool bursts into flame instantly. Did you ever fry an egg on a coal stove? It's no trick at all if you have the right equipment. This is a cold hot plate. And because it's cold, you can make it out of wood, if you like. Just be sure that there's a coil of wire inside and that you connect that coil to a high voltage alternating current source. The rest is easy. As long as we're being different, we'll use motor oil instead of Crisco. The egg fries very quickly, but the stove remains perfectly cold. In fact, if you wish, just to keep it handy, you can fry your egg on the morning newspaper. With a gadget like this, you can get up in the morning, sit on the stove, read the morning newspaper, and fry the eggs in your lap. Another example of the fact that physical forces can be quite selective in their effect. All of the examples which we have cited thus far have been in the physical realm, and of course have been limited by that fact. We can, however, cite examples that transcend the purely physical and clearly demonstrate the reality of these two worlds. We find the examples in the historical record of this book. In the opening chapters of Genesis, we find God and man in perfect harmony. These two worlds are one. And then something happened. Man sinned. Man disbelieved and disobeyed God. And immediately, God withdrew himself from man and placed a barrier, invisible but very real, between himself and man. That barrier has continued to exist throughout the ages. But 20 centuries ago, according to the Bible, God became flesh and dwelt among us. He didn't remove the barrier. Instead, he stepped across it. He became flesh and blood as we are. 
And in so doing, he provided the way that we in turn might cross that barrier back to him. For 33 years, Christ lived on earth. Then he died on a cross outside the city of Jerusalem. But on the third day, he rose again from the dead. Let's go back to that first Easter morning and see what happened. We find the account in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, beginning with the first verse. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went he in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. What did he believe? Why, well, he believed that Christ was risen from the dead. What did he see that made him believe that? An empty tomb? Oh, no. If he had seen an empty tomb, he would have agreed with Mary that someone had stolen the body of Christ. He didn't see an empty tomb. Instead, he saw the miracle of the undisturbed grave clothes. When Christ died, his body was prepared for burial according to ancient custom as a mummy. Christ may have been born in poverty, but he was not buried in a pauper's grave. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man according to the Bible, claimed the body of Christ and prepared it for burial by wrapping it in fine linen cloth. Custom in the Middle East was to wrap the body in hundreds of yards of linen cloth, binding it very tightly. When Christ rose from the dead, he had a spiritual body, out of tune with the material substance of this earth, out of tune with his grave clothes, so he just vanished from them, leaving them sunken and hollow and empty. Somebody says, okay, that's all right, but why was the stone rolled away from the door of the tomb? It was not to let Christ out, but to let the disciples in so that they could see and believe, become eyewitnesses of an event of enormous significance. On the evening of the same day, the disciples were gathered in fear and confusion in a room with the doors bolted shut. Suddenly, Christ just appeared in their midst and said, Peace be unto you. How did he get in the room? Christ entered that room in the same way that he vanished from his grave clothes, and for the same reason, he had a spiritual body. A miracle was performed, all right. But the miracle was not that Christ should walk through the wall but rather that the disciples with their purely physical eyes should be able to see him. We have said that Christ was out of tune with his grave clothes. What do we mean by this? Well, this phenomenon of resonance or its lack is not difficult to demonstrate, even in the purely physical realm of the laboratory. It is said that Caruso used to entertain his dinner guests by taking a goblet from the table and then he would sing across the open end with that magnificent voice of his, and the glass would shatter. Now, I'm no Caruso. But it's not difficult to duplicate this feat here in the laboratory. That is, if we use an electronic voice. The trick is to find the one note that will break the glass. We can determine this by placing a coin in the glass, and then tuning the frequency until resonance is reached. frequency, if we bring the glass into the direct sound beam, it shatters instantly. The sound becomes a very real thing when it is in tune with the glass. Did you ever get a good solid electrical shock? 
Ordinary house current is 60 cycle alternating current. When you stick your thumb up a light socket, that's where you rattle. You're in tune. Let's take another look at that million volts. That was well over a million volts with a lot of power behind it. If that were 60 cycle alternating current and the charge should go through my body to ground, there's no question as to the result. It would be instantly fatal. But we've changed the frequency from 60 cycles to 65,000 cycles. And at this frequency, a lot of power can be taken through a human body. We use the aluminum sphere on top of the transformer merely as a discharge point for the high voltage. With the assistance of Mr. Metzger, I'm going to stand in direct contact with the transformer, permit the voltage to pass through my body and out through my fingertips. The demonstration is not an easy one, but it is one which illustrates our point in such a way that I hope you'll never forget. To be in direct contact with the transformer, I must remove my shoes. It is necessary to provide metal caps for my fingertips to prevent serious burn and to provide points of discharge for the high voltage. Power. Lights. On. If there's any question in your mind about the amount of power that went through my body, I think this next demonstration will answer the question. It takes power to set a two by four on fire. Power. Lights. Off. There are two reasons why we must be born again. We've discussed one. Man is out of harmony with God and separated from him by a wall of invisibility. But there's another reason equally important. Man is not only out of tune with heaven, but he is in tune with the judgment of a righteous God upon sin. When Christ said, you must be born again, it was not just idle talk. It was a statement of profound significance. A statement that has anticipated, as we have seen, the very latest discoveries of modern science. But what is far more important, it is a statement that has anticipated the deepest need of a human soul. In view of these facts, the most important question that any man can ask is the question that Nicodemus asked of Christ. How can a man be born again? The answer to that question is the message of this book. Unfortunately, man has his own ideas on the subject. The popular concept seems to be that we really don't need to be born again. If we pay our debts, treat our neighbor right, live the golden rule, and do the best we can, we'll be all right. But God says, no, you must be born again. A basic change must take place in man, in his nature, his thinking, his living, Someday, even in the material substance of his body. God calls this change new birth. How can we be born again? Once again, the message of this book, the Bible, is the answer to that question. And it's startling in its simplicity. It may be summarized in one verse, John 1, 12. But as many as received him, 
To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I can almost hear a sigh of relief as someone says, why, is that all there is to it? Everybody believes. Are you sure? As we use the word believe, if we're sure, we say, I know. If we're somewhat uncertain, we say, well, I believe so. As the word believe is used in the Bible, it is far stronger than know. It is possible to know and not believe. It is possible for us to know that we're sinners, that the wages of sin is death. Yes, it is possible to know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin, that we might live. It is possible to know all this and still be lost, still not believe it. Here is a simple illustration. Two statements concerning this chair. First, I know it will hold me up. Second, well, I believe it will hold me up. Which statement is correct? The first. I know that that chair will hold me up because it's a good, strong chair. We wouldn't have it here in the laboratory if it weren't, but I don't believe it. Because as God uses the word believe, you can't believe in a chair standing up. Now I'm believing in the chair. I'm trusting myself to it. If a doctor should tell you that you have cancer and that if he doesn't operate, you're doomed to die, how do you believe in him? By agreeing with his diagnosis? No. You truly believe in the doctor when you let him operate, when you submit yourself to him. If I were to ask you right now, are you a child of God? If you experienced new birth, what would your answer be? Some people would say, well, I just don't know. If that is your answer, then you're standing beside the chair. You may have agreed with the diagnosis, but you probably haven't yet submitted yourself to the great physician. For when you truly believe, you'll know, because you believe. You'll be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Believing involves a decision, a decision that you can make right now.